Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor this podcast. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Also check out our brand new Two Million Blossoms, the podcast, also available on our website and on wherever you download and stream your podcast. All right, Kim, we're ready to get down to business and learn more about all these different hive types that aren't a standard Langstroth. Today we talk yeah. with Paul Longwell on the AZ Hive. And, and Kim, you know, I, I mentioned I, I know Paul from the Olympia Beekeepers Association. And uh, he and I took our, the University of Montana Master's Beekeeping Program uh, together. So I know he's a real smart guy, uh, Jerry Bromenshank, like Paul. So, you know, I'm looking forward to talking to him about AZ hives. Yeah, I know a little bit about AZ hives, but not enough to say I, I know anything at all, really. Um, I can spell it. Yeah, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, <laughs> but they gotta, there's got to be something going for them because a lot of people are beginning to use them. You know, uh, you're right. Uh, th- there's a lot of, I see a lot of pluses for them. And, and that's one of the great things about this series we've been doing is all the literature, and, and and I say all, and I'll say 95% of all the literature out there is about the standard Langstroth, all about all, all the management books. All, all of the publications are about Lang, Langstroth, although now there's a little bit more with the top bar hive, I will a say. A bit on top bar and long hive. There's a couple of books out there on those, um, especially the top bar hive. We had Christian. Mm-hmm. And and uh, the long hive uh, is going to be one coming out, and there's already one that's been out for a while uh, on on long hives and on top bar hives. So there's a few out there, but um, I'll tell you what what's a little just a little scary is how much stuff there's on the web on these things that <laughs> that you know uh, is it right? I don't know. Um, and, and you look at one and they say one thing and you look at another and they say something else. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be interested in talking to Paul, who's been successful with them doing it the way that it's supposed to be done. Yeah. And, and and he's a tinker. I mean, he, he builds things, he knows how the things work and how to make, improve them. And he's been a beekeeper for a long time. So, uh, it will be fun. And uh, your comment about the, the things you see on the internet, uh, and, and the different hype types, it's, it's been fun since we started this series, the, the emails we've received from other beekeepers who are say, uh, have you seen this type of hive? It's being used in this location, especially for like say queen production or something. And we'll, we'll respond to those in at a future date. Um, but it's, it's been fun. It, it's kind of a, uh, if, if a beekeeper, if you're tired of just doing the Langstroth or if you want to expand your beekeeping skills and, uh, exposure to new things, start looking at different hive types. You'll be, you'll be really happy. I think all of this kind of boils down to if it's good for the bees, it's probably not for the beekeeper. And if it's good for the beekeeper, it's probably not for the bees. And, and the more you experiment and find out what's good for the bees, uh, the better you the better you will do. And I think the happier your bees will be. Yeah. If bees are ever happy. <laughs> 
Well, I, I agree. And I, and I think there's room. I think there's room. I think every beekeeper, I won't say every, but, you know, many beekeepers enjoy that they have their colonies set for honey production or pollination. That's the business bees. And then off to the side, they have their one-offs. They have their top bars. They have their long hives. They might have the AZ hive. The the hives and the bees they they tinker with and 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 learn more about the bees and biology and behavior. And meanwhile, the other girls are out there working hard and bringing in the money. There you go. <laughs> so talking about working hard, you and Jim have been working hard on Honey Bee Obscure. How's that going? Well, we just finished one on dealing with old comb. And uh-huh. um, that that just came out the middle of last week, uh, and and I'll tell you, I've got a thing about old comb. I'm I'm <laughs> I got a re- it's a, almost a religion on getting rid of old comb because uh, looking at beeswax for as long as I have been working with the root company and beeswax candles, I know what's in that stuff, mm-hmm. and I don't want it in my hive. So you know, if there, I date my frames when I put them in, and in three years and often two they're gone i replaced the i replaced that wax so um but we explore that a little bit and and i, I think i i hope we can convince people to keep frames shorter times and recycle get that wax recycled so are you just uh punching out the old comb and inserting a new sheet of foundation uh maybe rewiring it or are you talking about just th- trashing the entire frame and putting in something new well, depending on how much time I've got, um, I I will scrape it off. I use plastic frames with plastic mm-hmm. foundation, one piece, or wooden frames with plastic foundation. You know, one one piece. Uh, I get them unwaxed, so I know what they're coming in. I wax them myself because I use my own wax. Uh, that's capping wax, so I know that it's as clean as I can get it. And then when I'm done, power wash it off, gather up the wax, and have a bonfire. <laughs> very good you know i had at one time when i lived there in ohio i had a better way wax melter and from altoona iowa and i don't know why i remember any of that but the better way wax melter was the ideal thing to have where you could take your old frames your old comb put it in there turn that sucker on overnight or for a couple hours it melt everything off you get a nice pan of, of melted wax, and your frames come out sterilized. It was really great, and I wish I had that today. It was quite the time saver. I wish it had survived Ohio, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they were nice when you could when you collect that wax and you could use it again for something. Mm-hmm. Um, since I don't, I'm, I've got a friend that, that still has one, and, and he uses it to get rid of his old wax, but he gets rid of his old wax. Mm-hmm. Mm. I wonder if he has my old, did he find it out on the street curb one, one day? <laughs> Cause I think that's what happened to mine. It, it went out there with a bunch of other stuff. And speaking of podcasts, we have uh, also, we've been working with Kirsten Trainer on her 2 million blossoms, the podcast. And uh, this week she released a new podcast. It's out on her website and also on Apple and Google. Uh, and this is her discussion uh, talk with Jeff Olerton on his book on pollination and pollinators and, and talks about the inner relationship between bees and flowers and other pollinators besides bees and, and the complex dance that they do to you know, live symbiotically. It's a fascinating discussion. We did a review of his book here a while ago. Yeah. Um, it's a great book. And, and uh, Kirsten's able to, to kind of loosen him up a little bit and get some more information out of him on, on the topics that he's good at. She's a good interviewer, and um, I'm going to be interested in listening to what she's got to say. It's really good. I encourage everyone to go out and take a listen to that Two Million Blossoms, the podcast. Speaking to listening to the very end of things, did uh, you happen to listen to the very end of our podcast last week on when we interviewed uh, Tina and the Long Hive? Did you hear that little surprise? If I said no, would you believe me? <laughs> <laughs> nope, I wasn't there. This was all yours. Yeah, you know, for our listeners uh, who listened to the very end, past the end of the music, they were rewarded, or most, many, or nine of you, <laughs> were rewarded with an opportunity to, to email us and receive a free beekeeping today podcast mug 
So kudos to Phil and Tyler and Rose and Peter. Yeah, and I got some of those emails too. One from David and Gary, Jacob and Nick. Yeah. They, they're they true believers right to the very end. Uh, we appreciate that, guys. We do, we do. And, and hold tight. Uh, they will be on their way if they're not on their way at the morning of this podcast release. Hey, Kim, do you have any books to talk about today? Yeah, Jeff, I still got five books open on my desk. Mm -hmm. But the reason I still got five books open on my desk is that Stephanie Brunau and I, she's a, a co-author, I have finished our book on Common Sense Natural Beekeeping. And and we both have a, a strong, oh, what's the word I want, a strong passion for not wanting to put poison in a beehive and for making bees live in a place that is that they're, I'm going to say it again, that they're happy in a place that they would choose. Let me put it yeah. that way, uh, given all of the other choices. So uh, Common Sense Natural Beekeeping, Stephanie Brunau and myself, it'll be out this summer. And uh, I guess I can say look for it. Excellent. I will. I hope I get a signed copy. Do you know anybody I could contact for that? <laughs> I probably find somebody. Uh, one thing about Stephanie, um, I want to mention she did a she did a book about five years ago called The Benevolent Bee, and it's all about using wax and propolis and and all of the benef all of the things that bees make that they share with with their with their keepers. So it, it's a good she did a good job. It's a good book, and and if you can find one, pick it up. Um, you'll be glad you did. Well, that said, let's get into the fun part of the show with uh, our discussion with. Paul Longwell on the AZ Hive. But first, a word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Hey everybody, welcome back. And while you're at Strong Microbials, make sure you check out their newsletter, The Hive. Subscribe to it today and learn everything about the honeybee. Hey, sitting across the Zoom table right now is Paul Longwell. Paul is a master beekeeper uh, with Washington State Beekeepers Association and with the University of Montana, and also one of our regional beekeepers. You can hear um, he was on our show, what, Kim, back in December. Welcome, Paul. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, Paul, it's good to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to see you guys again. Well, Paul, today we want to talk to you about, uh, in our discussions, we talked about the different hives you run, and you mentioned that you've been running, that you built and run an AZ hive. And and it fits right in with our Hive Types podcast series that we're going through right now. And and we're trying, trying to just talk about what is an AZ hive and, and what's different from it from a Langstroth hive. And if you can give us any history on it, that would be great. We came from Sylvania, you know, we're a very bee-oriented country. Uh, they started with the log hives, and then they turned around and uh, eventually moved into a, like the Langstroth type hives. Mm -hmm. But they, because of the cold weather in the mountain region, they needed more protection. And so they were looking at wall thicknesses and that, and they decided to go to a, uh, a bee house to protect the hives from, from the extreme weather of the mountains. And they developed from that. And they said, you know, we can't be lifting our boxes, everything like a Langstroth box here. You have boxes and you lift each one of those boxes are 90 to 60 pounds a piece. Yeah. Well, what they did is they went to kind of a kitchen cabinet type style where only the front of the hive faces the, the, uh, the atmosphere. And then they build an insulation on the front hive by a dead air space. And then you go through the hive through the back by opening up like a kitchen door. And then there'll be screens there 
that you could look at your bees and see what they're doing without without opening the hive up there you don't you don't have the temperature fluctuations or anything else like you know when you go into a Langstroth hive if you take the top off all, it immediately is the same temperature as the outside yeah and, and inspect your hive if it's raining or that so your bees have better temperament so the back of the hives inside a shed or a house a, 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 a little bee house mm -hmm. or, or a lean to or something like that they they mount them on trailers they mount them on trucks hmm. And they take them all over. You see trucks going down the highway over there with a hundred hives on them, all stacked up, two or three layers high on both sides. And they park the trailer right there in the field that they're at, and then just bring them back to their location. So, Paul, tell me how how do I get to look inside the hive at the frames to see how the queen's doing, to see uh, to check for diseases, that sort of thing. Well, what you do is you go into the back of the hive, and there will be almost like a kitchen door, kitchen cabinet door. So you just open it up, and inside that there will be removable doors. Usually there are uh, two, two different layers of the door. They'll have an inner door and a main door. The main door is like their screen, so you can just do a quick look. Or you can take the door off, and then you remove the frames just by pulling them out one by one. Cool. They have uh, AZ Hive has metal frames spacers in there that hold the frames at the B space, and they just you just slide them right out. All right, so I'm gonna I open the door in the back, and and then I can see the frames in there. So I reach in and I lift that frame just a little bit so it's out of that guide, and then I can. Yeah, you don't even have to lift it up. What they've got is they've got the frames have a concave on the top and bottom of them. So they're sitting on a metal rod, a three eight inch metal rod. So there's very little uh, area for propolis to n nail the frame down. So all you do, do is just lift it up a little bit and slide it right out. You know, on your Langstroth hives, you know how you have the wings? Well, on an AC frame, it's straight one inch, straight up and down. So you don't have those wings to deal with. So when you're pulling the frame out, you're not rolling any bees or anything. Oh, okay. And that's you're... that's one of the major um, problems with uh, us Americans adapting the AZ hive style over is there some people are attempting to build frames with the a the regular Langstroth frames with the wings, and then they end up rolling the bees, hmm. and it's not a good not a good adapting to their design. And there's no lifting. Right. And that was that's what one of the reasons I look at, you know, I'm not lifting 90 pounds of honey. I'm lifting six to seven pounds of honey. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I understand exactly how does. So how does the frame without wings or ears or wings sit in the AZ box? It sits on in the box. There's three rods that the frame sits on. On the it bottom. It has the frame. On each on each level, okay, okay, and then there's a metal spacer, you know, that sits there and has ten ten spaces in it for each frame. Okay, and so it goes specifically where it goes, and you know, like in um, in a length strip hive, you turn around and you're moving the whole box and you're moving boxes, you know, up and down. Mm -hmm. And in an AZ hive, you move frames around. If I need to turn around, if I need more space, I take a frame out and move it somewhere else in the hive and move another empty frame down to give them more space so they're not they're not uh, getting ready to swarm on me or that. Or if I need to take a frame out and say, okay, this is blackberry honey, this is specifically what I'm at, I just take that frame out right then and there and replace it with another one. So let, let me back up even further because I'm trying, I'm a visual learner. So I have to, I have to visualize this. When you open the kitchen door, when you open the door and look at the hive, are you looking at the end of the frames or are you looking to the front of a frame? I'm left looking at the end of the frames. So like a lineup of CDs or records on a shelf. Correct. Correct. Or books. Even. Just like, All just right. like books. All right. All right. Cool. Oh, well then, then you just mentioned levels or layers or it sounds like, there's an additional box or maybe two above that that bottom box? Typically, in an in a, in a AZ hive, you'll have your one brood chamber. 
down below. And then you'll have a queen excluder in there. And then up above, you'll have your, your one frame, your one box for your, your honey there. That's a typical thing. Americans, some Americans put uh, three or four levels in their hive so the queen excluder can be in a different position. Or if I wanted to on a, a three frame um, hive, if I want to, by putting in a solid board where a queen excluder would be, I could shut the bees off and treat it as a nuke or put another hive up on the third layer and share a, by putting another queen excluder, share another uh, a common honey area. So you have all kinds of different combinations you can do. That was a good question, Jeff. When you look at the front of the hive, the frames are not the way they are in our Langstroth hive facing the front of the, the front door, but they're, they're, the sides are facing the front door. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, then that, that makes a lot of sense. And do you see with that issue, one of the reasons that, that people use to use... Um, that, what's that name of that piece of that equipment that, that, that kept cold air from coming in so that the bees were able to use all of the frames right down to the front door? Do you have that issue? What does the front entrance look like? The front entrance, um, I should have sent you some pictures. The front frame is two layers. Okay, so you have your outside layer that has your paint on it. And then about three-eighths of an inch back, you have another another layer of lumber in there, another front, false front in there with a hole. So when the bees come in, they turn around and they're actually going through a gap. So the air does not get directly on the, on okay. the frames. All right. That makes sense. And, and, and I'm, I'm guessing you don't have that long front door like the Langstroth dive. You have a smaller entrance? No, it's, it's typically the recommended uh, half inch, half inch high by, uh, six inches something that bees like <laughs> as right. opposed to that big front door that we have correct okay. yeah they like a total of one and a quarter inches um for their their amount of space so then that each each level has its own box it has its own door that you can open and close as you want oh that's good okay it's nice for the honey flows so could you so you could have more than one uh layer there you could have two three four Yes, like I mentioned before, you could turn around and, and do what the uh, old combination of two queens and a hive by having uh, your yeah. third layer up on top, put a queen excluder on, have a hive, an active hive up there and an active hive on the first level and then share a honey store in the middle to fill it up better or to turn around and for winter survival. That's, that's sort of like our, the two queen system that Tom was yeah. talking about a while yeah. ago. Yeah. Yes. So this is so. So I'm visualizing walking into the shed mm-hmm. and, and, and you have, you can have multiple beehives in that shed with the doors facing on one side or either side, I assume, right? I mean, you Correct. could have a big shed, multiple hives. Correct. If you, if you look at my shed, it has, it has three hives in a row, just mm-hmm. like a, just like a regular kitchen cabinet. You know, you go in and you open this door, that's one hive. You open up the next door, that's the next hive and you open the next door, that's the next one. How high are they? They're about 26 inches high. Off the ground? Oh, mine are 18 inches. I adjusted mine. I, I went down to Harbor Freight and bought one of those mechanic stools that I sit on. So I just sit down there and and sit on the stool, <laughs> open the door, and I'm right at eye level for what I need to do. No bending, no reaching. My back stays just as good as the one I went in there. Oh, Wait, you, you mean... Working your bees isn't laborious and backbreaking. <laughs> no, it's it's nice. And what I like about it is because you have vents that you can open and close on the doors in the back. Mm-hmm. You get you get the beautiful smell of the whack of the the bees, mm-hmm. the aroma of the from the hive. Something you don't get on a Langstroth hive. You know you don't you have a sealed unit. You really don't smell anything. You don't hear the bees or anything. Well, it, because of those screen doors and that, you hear the you hear the hives, and you can tell you you hear the you could go in the hive. It's nice to go into a in your bee hut and hear the queen piping, and that which makes it so kind of nice. Oh, cool. Do you have any lighting in your shed? Well, what I have is I can darken. I have the choice so I can darken the inside, mm-hmm. or I can have the red light a red light on. So depending on what I want to do. 
or I could turn on my big bright fluorescent lights and yeah. do what I want. What I've got mine set up for is I uh, moved all my AB equipment in there. So on one end, I have storage and then I have my hunting extractor and everything right there in one contained unit. Instead of uh, the wife getting after me for, you've got too much stuff out here, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but you take a frame out, you extract it, you put it back in. You got uh, it. Um, that's nice. almost too easy. Uh, how how warm does it stay in the winter? The I was seeing it in there in the 40, 42 to 40, 45 on an average with no heat on, into the building. That is one, one advantage that I do have. In the winter with just a little heater, I can heat the the hive, the the hut open a little bit and I can maneuver and look at my bees a little bit. If they're stuck or something like that, I can actually warm it up a little bit to turn around and work my bees. Something you can't do in the snow, Jeff. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, you'd have to be careful it didn't get too warm in there, right? And Correct. You, you have to Correct. monitor like we were talking to John Miller and, and they have to just monitor the, the, the hive temperature and the, and the storage shed. You really have many of the same situations in the, in a bee hut. Yeah. It's the same, it's the same thing. You, you know, I'll, I'll keep a window open if I want to crack just a little bit, you know, to turn around and, and keep them cool so that you're not over abundant, but you know, I have the ability to see my bees and where they're at. And if they're in trouble, I could, I could heat it up really quick, put something in and close it back down really quick without affecting them very much, which makes it nice. You know, one thing I was uh, in talking with Slovenians and that, you know what their winter loss rate is? 12 to 15 percent. Wow. It's 43 percent here in the United States for a length strip. Yeah. For the ones that sit outside, we just talked to John Miller, who in, winters indoors. And he's seeing the same kind of percentage loss, ten to ten right. to fifteen percent. So it makes, I mean, there's, it makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you a question. Then I come into your building, and I sit down on that perfectly height stool, and I open the door <laughs> and I reach in and I pull out a frame and I'm looking at it. And three bees decide to leave and fly up to where and how do I get them back in the hive? Well, typically, what happens in a hot in a AZ hive is Usually on top of your roof, since you're in more in a darkened environment, you have a a bee escape, a hole for them. So with with all the with the no windows opened and dark darkened, they head for the light and they just go right on out the roof vent, and they're right back around front and they're right back in their hive. Or when I'm working a big frame, what I'll do is I'll put in what we call a bee frame a bee table. And when I open up the hive, I put my bee table there, which is kind of like a trough, open trough with open on one side of the AZ hive. And I will turn around and just brush the bees and in back into the hive. And you just watch them go to that table right back into the hive. So the trough is, just sits down in front of the, the, the hive? and Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So this sounds really like too good to be true, Paul. <laughs> I'm thinking of the same so, thing, Jeff. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's it, like. I, I need to go build one now. What, what's what's the downside? The downside is when you look at the difference. If you have a, a Sylvania hive, their frames are bigger. They're they're deeper and sh and shorter. And I have um, AZ frames that are Langstroth style. So one of the downsides are um, extraction equipment. You have to have mm -hmm. an extractor that does tangently because you're dealing with deep size frames. So uh, a lot of people typically have something like a Ranger or something that only takes, you know, regular Western frames. So they would need to get a different extractor. Or or an extractor that can extract deeps, right? Radially. Right. Or something mm -hmm. that when I, my Max does do them tangentially. So yeah. I have no problem with that. It just takes me longer to extract because I have to flip the frame over halfway through. That's That's one of the differences. And one of the other disadvantages is there's not many uh, English books out there right now on AZ hive management. So um, you're, you're dealing with a lot of people, you're asking advice from them, and they don't know anything about them. So it's a best guess. And the best guess they usually say is, no way do you want one of those, <laughs> you know, typically like a top bar or, or a long way for that. You know, all our training is about the Langstroth hive. 
Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. Well, I know you, Paul, you're, you're a handy, crafty kind of guy. You, how much of the equipment have you built and how much have you purchased through a vendor somewhere? Well, I bought my first hives because I wanted to get them up fast. So mm-hmm. they cost me about $300, $400 a piece. Uh, would I go that route again? No. Uh, <laughs> now, especially what I know, you know, uh, I'll build all my own place and I have the plans and everything to do it correctly so that's what i'm in the process of doing is taking the dribberville hives out and replacing them with what i i like and the craftsman that i like and and you mentioned plans leads right to my next question what is your source for plans on the hives that you're building well there's a several uh facebook uh facebook groups like az hives northwest we have the plans available in our in our uh, file membership file directory, and there's some AZ uh, advocate sites on Facebook that also have the plans available. And once you join the communities, there's usually somebody that has access to the plans. They're really simple to build. Mm-hmm. One of my best friends over on uh, Peninsula, she just looked at the plans and started building them. She built them almost like a length strip where she took the frames, but she changed the design by cutting off one end and adding a door and adding and in this, the inner screen part. Paul, let me go Very back cool. and ask something just fundamental here. When you've got these hives side by side, right? Snug and right. Um, snugged up right next to each other. Do you see much problem with drifting? No, I don't because they have so many patterns on the, on the front of the hives, you know, like I have the sea, our favorite Seahawks on one. So, you know, of course the Seahawks aren't going to go over to the, the, to the butterfly ones. So, you know, I don't notice too much drifting. Okay. The Seahawks aren't going to go down to the 49ers hive. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and, and I know that, I know that people do this. You could build one of these on the back of a truck. So you could actually do commercial pollination with them drive them to the field and let them sit or on a trailer right yes that's one of my that was one of my dreams to do is is to build another unit and i've got a uh, car bed trailer i was going to make something that i can mount on the car bed trailer just haul the whole building on and take it to the county fair and let people go inside and observe the hives and everything else out without getting stung hmm the the thing that interests me the most, I think, about all of this is is the no lifting part of it. Uh, you've commented on it. I I'm going back to it again just because um, that that to me is becoming more important every day. Is <laughs> right. having to lift having to lift a, a deep super full of honey isn't going to happen anymore. So I can see the advantage of that. The advantage of being able to work it. You can work on a rainy day. You got it. I was I was out there in the snow looking at my hives and, and looking at my bees and making sure they had everything they needed, you know, and everything else. I crushed through like a foot and a half of snow to get to it. But once I went inside, it was comfortable. You could also you could also say, you know, I, I'm, I get home from work at uh, eight o'clock at night. It's dark. I could go into your your shed and work bees at nine o'clock at night. You can. And one of the differences is, you know, how you have your big smokers and your Langstroth hives. You know, here we just use a, it's a smoke stick. It looks just like a little uh, wafer that you just turn around and light one in and the smoke goes out and it not, you're not overpowered, but it calms the bees down. And, you know, you're not really messing with their house much by tearing, tearing the roof off and everything. Hmm. So they, they pretty well stay in their hive and just leave you alone. Yeah, that's an interesting question. What, what, you know, in Langstroth, every once in a while, regardless of the season, you come across a pretty testy hive. Uh, what, it, have you run across that in the AZ hive or in your hut? No, I haven't. I, I run all carnies in my hives. You know, uh, 
I haven't had any issue with being stung or anything all, all last season at all. Um, like I said, you're not, you're not ripping the top of the hive off to change their temperature and everything on them. You're only moving one frame at a time out. You will move, you know, one frame out uh, at the end so you can have a little bit more room. And then since they're in those spacers, they'll just kind of move sideways like opening a book. And then you, so you have the room to pull it out, look at the bees and put it right back in and then close it back up and put that last frame back in. Hmm. <laughs> so you've, you run AZ hive and, and we've talked, you, you, you run a long hive or the top bar hive. Is that correct? And you've run Langstroth. I run top bar and Langstroth. Okay. And I've had a lot, I've had a lot more winter loss and a lot more issues with the Langstroth than I've ever had with the top bar or the, az hive interesting it's it's back to that old saying jeff if it's good for the bees it's probably not good for the beekeeper but uh i mean i'm thinking this one tends to be good for both yeah definitely yeah so the the investment the initial investment unless you have a shed already set the initial investment's a little bit higher to get into this that's the issue you know you need some type of storage now some people all have done is taken uh a couple four by fours and put them in the post and then build a little platform, almost like the rural mailbox carriers Mm -hmm. and then a little slanted roof on it and then turn around and protection for the hive and then just put them in there. So what they do is they open up the back door, almost kind of like a electrical panel box and then their hive will sit in there. So you can get in, you can get in there fairly cheap. The main cost is your, your hives. However, with, 10% 10% loss every year, you're catching that up real fast. Yes, you are. Well, it sounds, it still sounds too good to be true, Paul. I just, uh, um, but I do like the idea of being inside and working the bees and, and, and disturbing the bees a little bit less than I would be in a Langstroth hive. Yeah, it's, it's nice because, you know, when I was, before I retired, I can get out there and go out early in the morning and just check them. If I needed to turn around and uh, change the, uh, the feeders for their sugar water or something like that, I can do it. Boom, 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 you know, and I don't, I'm not popping any lids off or anything else. I'm not dealing with rain or anything. And I can, you know, then come back at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night when I got off from my IT job go out there and double check on them, which is nice. You can't do that at night, you know, yeah. on the lake strip or even a top bar. And that's a good point with the the feeder. Do you set all, are your feeders all on the inside of the shed or yes, are they in the set just, like the Boardman feeder? Well, what you do is it's kind of like a Boardman feeder. What it does, it, it is, is it's um, two, like a Boardman feeder that fits right on the back door. You take the mm-hmm. back door open, the inner door has, has an area where you put the feeder at and it stays there. And mine have a screen on the bottom of them. So the hive, they can't come up any further than that screen. And I can just change the jar right then and there. That's really nice. Do you wear a bee suit and a veil? I haven't had a bee suit on in a while. I do wear a veil because, you know, getting stung in the nose or the eyelid is never yeah. any good. That makes that makes perfect sense. But, but it sounds like almost you wouldn't need one. But... Uh... Better safe than sorry, but certainly not a bee suit. I can see that. No, if I have something on, it's an inspector jacket. You still, you save some more money there, Jeff. Yeah. Yep. Oh, now you tell me. I just spent all that money in that new BJ Sheriff Honey Rustler. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, well, that, that, I really like that jacket. I'm just kidding. Um, so looking back on the downside, the upfront cost. Uh, there's no uh, books really available on AZ Hive management, uh, readily available, at least written in English, and it doesn't use Langstroth frames, correct? That's cor- that's correct, and that that's the b- one big warning I want to give a lot of people. There's a lot of manufacturers that are selling them on the internet here with the AZ uh, with the Langstroth style frames, mm-hmm. the standard ones with the wings on there. Those are a bad combination in the AZ hive because of the way the hive, you take the hives in and out. I do not recommend those at all. All right. Well, that sounds like great advice. Duly noted. So what have we missed, Paul? 
Well, we're pretty well covered it. Uh, they're just a good style hive. I, I love my hives. And if I had a bigger shed, I would go to it and immediately, you know, but you have to do the consideration. How many hives does your surrounding support? Yeah. Because the one thing is a, a Langstrip hive, it's easy to put on a trailer or a truck and take it some down the road someplace. But an AZ hive, if you have a building on your own property, you've got to figure out what's in the surroundings and how much that surroundings will support the hive. Yeah, I can see that. But, but, uh, I got to tell you, you got a building and you don't have to fill it up with hives. You can, like you do, fill it up with extraction equipment and store stuff there and uh, solve solve a whole bunch of problems at once. You got it. I can, I'm just sitting here thinking about the, installing packages may not be a problematic, but installing uh, nukes, you can't install a regular nuke because well, of the frame differences. When I when I install nukes in, in a new AZ hive, what I do is since I build my own frames, is I leave the top frame off. So my bottom frame and the sides are already air stapled together. Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll take uh, a nuke and I'll put it in the chamber that I'm going to put it into and let the bees just rest there. And then I'll take one frame out at a time. And then what I use is my saw and I'll cut the front. What I'll do is I'll go around with an X-Acto knife around the frame, the plastic frame, to loosen it up on both sides. And I take a saw on both sides and cut off the end, the, the side, just on the top. And then I pull the top bar off. And then I just turn around and take the frame, the foundation off, lay it in the AZ high frame. And then I put the AZ high frame on and then just tack it with a stapler really quick and put it in the hives, keeping the same, same way. And for a package, all I do is move the queen over. I put my table down for the bees, and then I just shake them in, and they go straight to the queen. Um, that's, a, that's a good question, Jeff. And I wonder, <clears throat> when it comes to packages, one way to install a package in Langstrop Hive is to put your package in the bottom box and have it open and, and have all of your frames in the box above it and put the queen up there. And so all you have to do is put your, put your um, package in the bottom, open it up, take your, take your queen out first, put your package in the bottom, put your queen above and shut the door. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. The same thing. And then, and then once they're all moved over, just move the frame, take the frames one by one, yeah. move them yeah. down to the lower and set your hive the way you want it. Okay, and 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 is, do you have or do you know if people have um, nuke colonies with AZ equipment in them already? So you could just take those frames out and and transfer them. There's not very many. I think there's some on the East Coast that I've been hearing about, but I don't have any names for it. Uh, one thing I do by having the AZ style hives is I have these plastic adapters, or I could turn around and put a. Uh, a dowel on the top of it, I can put the frames over into a, a Langstroth hive and then turn around and have them build it out and then move those frames back to an AZ hive if I want to make a nuke. Okay, so if it doesn't work, you can make it work without a whole lot of grief, it looks like. Correct. Okay. Now, if, you're using, if you're using the original um, AZ hive, which is, like, like I said, it was longer, deeper, what I'll have to do is I'll have to put something like a shim on under, underneath my deep length strip hive box for the additional space, and then put it in in the box. It sounds sounds doable, Jeff. What do you think? I, I'm going to go ask my wife uh, if, if I can go build a shed this summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, good luck with just that. Tower, just towers for the lawnmower, and then turn around and kick the lawnmower out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, good. Well, Paul, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show talking to us about AZ Hives. I enjoyed it. We'll have to follow up with you this fall when we have the regional beekeepers back and find out how your AZ Hives did over the summer. Okay. Will do. All right. Paul, it's been, it's been good. I've learned a lot. Thank you. You're welcome, Kim. Thanks a lot, Paul. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Well, hey, Kim, I'm all ready to go out and buy an AZ Hive setup if it weren't for the shed that I have to build, too. Yeah, you know, I've looked at these things a lot and and, and getting ready to talk to Paul. I, 
you know, went online and I looked at them and I'm just kind of thinking, this is just not going to work. But talking to somebody who makes it work and makes it work easily, mm-hmm. um, I can I, I can see some definite advantages. Of course, I mentioned lifting. That's a big one. But yeah. there's some other advantages here, too, that I like. And, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to get a shed or I'll ever get there, but... Um, I think a lot more about them now than I did before I studied them here. Yeah. Well, I think that you could move a couple chickens off their perches and, and put in, <laughs> and you'd have plenty of room. <laughs> yeah, I could. There you go. I go out and collect <laughs> eggs and check bees. It, you know, that sounds like a perfect life for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think it's really cool. And I, I really like the idea of having the the colony inside that controlled environment. I mean, and having multiple bees in there, I, th- I think I'm not seeing a whole lot of downside. I'll have to go up and visit Paul and see his operation and see how it actually works. And, uh, and during inspection and even pulling frames for honey. But, uh, one of the things that he, he explained that solved a lot of, a lot of issues that I had in my head was when I pull that frame up, bees leave, they fly yeah. somewhere. And, <laughs> You know, why didn't I think of putting an escape in the ceiling, you know, that you can open and close for, you know, when you, you, you open it when you come in and you close it when you go out and you say so you got no weather problems and um, and they're going to leave the minute they, you know, the minute they leave the frame, they're not going to buzz around you and they're not going right. to go, you know, they're going to go boom up away, up and away from you. So they're going to go to the light. I, I was impressed with that idea. And, it's, you know, it's one of those um uh, common sense things that just why didn't I think of that? But I know it's did. A, a, a basic question. But even even if it was in a dark in a dark shed with a red light, you know, so you can see, would they leave the frame? Would they fly off? Good question. I, I, I really don't know. I've I've not worked bees. I've not pulled frames at night. I've I've moved bees and everything, but I've not worked frames at night to know whether they actually leave. I'm sure they if do. You, but. If you recall talking to John Miller about his winter overwintering hives, when a bee dies in a hive there, one of the undertaker bees flies out to get rid of the body and can't find her way back yeah, because of the lost. dark. So yeah. um, I, I can see where that might be an issue at night if one came out, went out through the escape and went, you know, holy cow, it's dark. What the heck? Yeah. But um I, I don't see that being a big problem, and, and it solves a lot of other problems. Yeah. Well, something else to look into. <laughs> All right. Well, that about wraps it up for the, the show today. Hey, I, before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts for every download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for our podcast know what you like. You can get there directly on our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for the continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We want to thank Vera and Slava at Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank our latest supporter of the podcast, Better Bee, for joining us. Check out their full line of beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And when you check with any of our sponsors, let them know you got you heard from them at Beekeeping Today Podcast. They'd like to hear from that. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today Podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? Well, just that thing on questions. We're beginning to get uh, quite a few. And uh, thank you. Send some more. And and we get right back to you. And we'll be reading more on future episodes. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Kim. Take care. You too, Jeff. <laughs>